our State of Ready webcast, and I am Morgan Scott, the Director of Climate Ready. Incredibly pleased to have everyone here today to join us for this State of Ready webcast. Um, before we actually jump into our conversation, I do want to pause for a moment and recognize that this is the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Certainly that is an incredible day of world history, and I hope that everyone takes a moment to reflect on that history and the bravery of those who stormed the shores of Normandy um, 80 years ago today, and of course, of the bravery of those that continue to serve and protect our freedoms now and today. So um, wanted to be sure to acknowledge that, um, but really pleased, like I said, that we have the next hour together to talk about Climate Ready and take stock of where we are and where we are headed. Before we get rolling, I do want to make a couple of notes in terms of housekeeping. So you have been muted upon entry. And while we do welcome your comments and questions throughout this webcast, we definitely want to get that feedback and, and answer any questions you might have. We are going to ask that you use the chat feature in order to contribute those comments and questions. So in the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen, you'll see the chat button. If you open that up, it will open the panel. Um, you can either contribute your comment or question to everyone, or if you would like it to be anonymous, you can change in the drop-down menu to Aguarin. He will take your comment or question, and we will be able to contribute it on your behalf. To enhance accessibility to today's conversation, we have enabled closed captioning. So if you look in the bottom left-hand corner of your WebEx screen, you will see the closed captioning button. If you press that, it will bring up the panel, uh, which will allow you to read the transcript as we talk through today's conversation. And as with all of our resources, we were, are recording today's webcast, and we will make that recording and the slides available to you on our website. So please feel free to check back there early next week. We will have everything uploaded for you to access. With that, I'm really pleased, as I've said before, to welcome you all to today's conversation. It is a great opportunity to take a pause. There is an incredible amount of activity that is underway through Climate Ready, and it is very easy to get caught up in that activity and lose sight of the big picture. Uh, and so today is really that opportunity to come back, to pause, to think about all that we have accomplished in the past year. We do run on a May to May schedule. So it's that time to reflect on the past year, which we've captured in the annual report, which has just published. So a lot of what you're going to hear today is captured in that annual report. And I encourage you to pull that down um, and to give it a flip through, use it as a resource to communicate. Today is also our chance to look ahead. There is a lot to come in this third and final year of Climate Ready. Um, so this is going to be a bit of a preview. Hopefully many of you, this will not be a surprise as you see what is planned for the next year. Um, but it is wonderful, like I said, to kind of step back and see it all in one place. Before we get into the details of our conversation, um, I thought it would be good for us to hear from our leadership. And so one of the engagements that we have through Climate Ready is through our um, industry-led board working group. And so this is where executives from a wide variety of power companies have a chance to come together quarterly to have a conversation about Climate Ready and what's happening in this space. And since the launch of Climate Ready, Stan Connolly of Southern Company has been the lead of our board working group. And so um, Stan unfortunately could not join us today, um, but he did record a video message, which I'm going to play. Uh, and then I will introduce our incoming board working group chair, Steve Powell. But first, let me give Stan a chance to share a few words with you all from his perspective um, and what he's seen through the past two years. Well, hello, and thank you for joining us today as we spend a little time reflecting on the first two years of our important work with Climate Ready, and we talk about what's ahead. Uh, look, the last 12 to 18 months or so have once again been reminders of why this work is so important. You think about the extremes of weather and the longer-term climate trends, and you bring that into the reality of today with heat waves, with wildfires, with strong winter storms, uh, with Europe experiencing their second warmest period on record. All of those are healthy reminders of why this work is so important. 
that we come together and think through common ways of assessing uh, longer term trends and how, what they mean to our own planning and then putting that planning and ad adaptation to work either in real time or as we plan for our future. That's why this work has been so important and it's already bearing fruit for all of us. Right here at Southern Company in January of this year, we experienced winter storm Heather, uh, one of multiple strong winter storms we've experienced in the Southeast in the last few years. And over the course of that time, we've learned with and from you, and we've gained insights through this work in climate ready that better prepared us and thankfully, we were able to navigate our way through that storm with no major issues for our customers. But it didn't come without great forethought and planning, and so much of that is really to be attributed to the work of this group and the collaboration across this industry as we learn together. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you on behalf of my customers, and I think all over the world, all over your territories, uh, our customers would appreciate the kind of collaboration that comes from Climate Ready. Look, as we transition into year three, uh, it's also a personal transition for me. Uh, I'm coming off of the EPRI board and I'm handing the chair or the, the torch, so to speak, to Steve Powell from Southern California Edison to lead Climate Ready going forward. Uh, Steve has incredible experiences of his own and he can bring to this, but I'm so excited to see his leadership in action with Climate Ready. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you to all the utility partners and investors in this. Thank you to all the affinity group members I think about the organizations like NOAA and the National Labs and IEEE. This really has been a great collaborative, and I just appreciate the hard work you put into this. Southern Company will stay engaged. Look forward to hearing more out of you as we work on year three deliverables and we make our industry better for our customers as we go forward. Thank you again. Great. So a great opportunity, like I said, to hear from Stan. And now, Steve, it's wonderful to have you stepping into this role. We are really lucky to have your leadership as we move into year three. And as we keep saying, land this plane uh, next spring as we look at the publication of version one of the framework. So, Steve, welcome and appreciate you sharing a few words with everyone as well. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Morgan. And good morning, everybody. Um, let me start by just saying thanks to Stan. I worked with Stan for a number of years on the EPRI board and uh, across other industry engagements and really can't think of enough for his vision and support as the Ready Board Working Group Chair uh, in helping get this launched and get ready to this point. Um, I think everyone's certainly benefited from his leadership and his experience at Southern. And uh, we're all grateful for the time and effort that he's dedicated to it. And so big shoes to fill. Um, but I'm excited to take on this role. Uh, it's really an important topic for us at, at SCE. Um, at Edison, like many of our peers across uh, in California and across the West, we spent a lot of time understanding and mitigating our wildfire risk. Um, but the wildfire risk is not the only one we face, just like everybody else. Um, we see heat domes that impact the entire West. Uh, we've got tropical storms now that, happen, that hit California, extreme rain, rain and flooding, heavy snowstorms. So we see a little bit of everything. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot more to come as these come together and get more intense with climate change. Um, so we know that our systems need to be more resilient to these events as customers are gonna be two to three times more dependent on their electric service as you look out towards 2045 as everyone begins to de decarbonize and electrify. Um, so we've been thinking about how to mitigate these risks uh, for climate for, for a while. Um, most recently, our climate adaptation vulnerability assessment, which is something that all the California utilities have to do, um, which is a precursor to our general rate cases now. Um, so it, it formed the basis for our 2040, 2025 general rate case. And we looked at fire, we looked at flooding, we looked at extreme heat, sea level rise, and even the combination of those in a 10, 30, and 50 year time frame. Um, and those are informing the actions we take now. In our current general rate case, uh, we've requested more than $100 million of investment for mitigations beyond our wildfire, uh, wildfire risk. So we know, we know that the investments need to be had, but we also know that identifying, prioritizing, and justifying these investments is something that needs a lot more definition and consistency in how we do these across our industry. And that's where Climate Ready comes in. So as we look to this uh, year three of Climate Ready, there is a lot to do that building on the success of the last two years as we get this across the finish line. So Morgan would say our bogey is May 2025 when we plan to officially launch uh, version one of the framework. Version one will be a comprehensive set of guides, resources, and, uh, and tools that provide a rigorous approach to exploring exposure, vulnerability, and risk 
to inform the design, hardening, and planning of the power system of the future in consideration of all the climate change, uh, climate change and climate that we need to be resilient to. Of course, while the uh, framework will publish uh, next spring and ready as an initiative will begin to wind down, that doesn't mean that the work will be done. We know that with a cl changing climate, we're gonna be constantly evaluating this stuff. So there's gonna be more to tackle beyond 2025. So I look forward to working with all of you to finalize the research uh, and developing a transition plan and identifying opportunities where we can work with um, all the collaborating, collaborating organizations and keep it going. Finally, I wanna uh, uh, echo Stan's call to action. We need you, we need everybody's help in this. The work is better because of the diverse input we've gotten from all of our peer groups and peer companies. Uh, from the Climate Ready uh, um, Affinity Group and our colleagues. And so if you're online today, thank you. And if you're not a member, then consider jumping in and leading that. So if you're unclear on how to get involved, please don't hesitate to reach out to the team at any time at Climate Ready, uh, at climateready at epri.com. And with that, thank you again for joining us today. And I will turn it back to Morgan to walk us through the rest of the day. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Steve. No doubt Southern California Edison has a lot of experience in this space that is really going to lend itself well to continuing to inform this space. And, and thank you again, as I've said, for your leadership. So with that, Steve actually did a very good job of overviewing what Climate Ready is trying to do and what we're looking to produce as we move towards spring of next year. But I do think that's where I wanted to start. So um, just a reminder for us all of what we are looking to achieve. And that is over these three years to develop a comprehensive framework for assessing physical climate risk to the power system. And that means extreme weather today and the climate we're experiencing today, as well as how those long-term climactic change in the decades to come will inform what we need to do in terms of the design and build out of the power system of the future. And when we say power system, we're talking comprehensively here, right? So we're talking about generation, P&D, and we are also thoughtful about customer assets, both in terms of impacts to those assets from the climate, as well as how they might be able to inform uh, the mitigation strategies that we employ. So through Climate Ready, we have, of course, our three work streams, one focused on physical climate data guidance to take stock of the climate data that exists in terms of availability, quality, suitability, and where those gaps might be. Work stream two focused on the asset space, really, about exposure and vulnerability at the asset level. So how you take that climate data and the framework for then understanding the vulnerability and adaptation strategies at that asset level. And then work stream three pulls it up to that system planning and prioritization space. So if you understand vulnerability at an asset, how does that inform a larger analysis from a system level? And what is the prioritization guidance that can be provided that goes beyond kind of a traditional cost benefit assessment and beyond just the climate factors, but thinks about all those factors that impact and a company needs to consider in the prioritization of their decisions and investments. So we will dig more into each of these work streams in just a moment. But before we do that, the last thing I want to say from an introductory standpoint is that one of the major milestones for Climate Ready is around networking and building a community of power companies and industry stakeholders to not just advance the development of this framework, but to have a conversation and ongoing engagement during this three years and beyond. And so as we looked at the successes of year two, we really moved beyond 150 organizations that have formally contributed to Climate Ready. Of course, that includes power company participants. So we're really pleased to have 42 power companies in the US, Canada, UK, and France that are actively engaging in a part of this conversation and framework development. Um, and we moved past 100, which is fantastic, organizations that have formally signed on to the CLAG, our Climate Ready Affinity Group. Um, there are a wide variety of organizations that have joined the CLAG, and it is demonstrative of the wide varieties of experience and expertise that is out there and frankly needed in order to move this dialogue forward, in order to move this framework forward, and in order to build a more resilient power system of the future. So 
as was said, I really want to thank you all. Again, we can't do this without your contributions and engagement. It truly enhances the value of this work and the value of the conversations that we have together. So with that, I am going to go ahead and kick us off into our work stream highlights. I think it's really nice to hear about the accomplishments and the activities both underway and forthcoming from all of our, our leads. So we have a large leadership team when it comes to climate ready and for each work stream, we'll have one person present sort of where they are. So Laura Fisher is our lead on work stream one. And Laura, I invite you to share some details around what's going on in your work stream. Thanks so much, Morgan. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all today to share about the great work that's going on in Workstream One. Um, we've done, we've made a lot of progress over the the last two years, um, and I've got got a lot to share. So, I just wanted to start off by talking a little bit about the priorities for Workstream One. What are our main areas of focus? So as Morgan mentioned, um, we're focused on physical climate data and guidance. This involves identifying the climate data that is available to meet industry-defined requirements. And I think this is a really important point. Um, there's a lot of climate data out there that have a lot of different applications, but we're, what we're focused on is understanding what are um, the climate data that are most relevant for power system applications and where do power system models, tools, other analysis, where do they need climate data and how, what, um, what types of and quantifications of climate data do they need there? Um, we're also interested in understanding the suitability and fitness of different climate data types for different applications. So um, how do we accomplish this? Um, one, we are assessing climate trends. So, you know, we are climate data analysts and experts on the Workstream One team. Um, we are looking at evaluations of observed and projected changes in relevant climate variables, doing our own analysis there, um, and helping folks in the industry understand what has changed, what, what have we observed, and what might be changing in the future, what are our expectations there. We're also focused on evaluating climate data. This is a big part um, of our work portfolio, and I'll be talking about a couple deliverables um, that we've published in this space. Um, so we want to assess the climate data availability and suitability for different power system applications. Uh, we're also recently wrapping up a climate data gap analysis, talk a little bit about um, what additional climate data might be needed in order to complete this type of assessment for the power sector. And then our third priority is to help build climate literacy within the power sector. So um, we recognize that um, climate data and the use of climate science and climate data in different applications is a complex topic. It comes with new terminology and new concepts. So we've been real, working really hard to develop trainings to help improve practitioner understanding of key concepts and terminology related to um, the, the climate data landscape. So again, those are our three priorities and uh, the work that we're doing in Workstream One is, is hopefully helping to advance these goals. So what are the, some of the things that, that we've been working on? Um, so one deliverable that we recently published in support of this was our climate data inventory. And so the, the links on this slide are, are live. So when you uh, get the materials afterwards, you'll be able to access the climate data inventory. Um, this is a curated catalog of climate and weather data sets. Um, that are available to support power system analyses. I wanna put some emphasis on the word curated. Um, it currently assesses more than 60 climate data sets. Obviously there are more than 60 climate data sets in the world, um, but these are data sets that we believe are relevant for different power system applications. So we wanted to help um, take some of the, the guesswork out of which climate data sets are relevant for different power system applications. Um, this is an online tool so you can um, go to the website, go to the inventory website, and use multiple filter criteria um, to sort based on, on application needs. Um, there's also some inventory documentation there that includes some recommended screening questions for both historical and forward-looking data sets. So if there's a data set that you're using that's not included there, but you want to kind of understand the suitability or fitness of that data set for your application, you can walk through those those screening questions. Um, we do plan to keep the data inventory updated uh, periodically. So there's a way for you to submit data sets for consideration um, or submit kind of other um, suggestions for consideration as well. And, and there's info for how to do that on the inventory website. So I recommend checking that out. 
Um, the other thing that we recently released is our climate data users guide, um, and this is also an online resource that's navigable um, and, and hopefully easy to, to use. And um, there's a lot of different questions that we um, have received about the use of climate data in, in different contexts. And so we see this as uh, a resource for helping to answer some of these, these common questions and, and then some more as well. Um, so some of the different ways that you can use the Climate Data User's Guide, there are several different articles that you can click through, um, but I think some of the, the kind of helpful uh, questions that it, that it helps answer are, um, what is the different historical and forward-looking climate data availability for power system relevant variables and hazards? So I apologize if it's a little bit small, but you can see on the right-hand side, um, we've created these tables for a variety of different climate variables and hazards and event types that are relevant to the power sector, and you can see what the data availability is um, for the different time periods. Um, you can also learn how to assess the quality of historical observations and confidence in future projections. So um, what is the method you might use to understand sort of um, the quality of your data set. So on the right-hand side here, um, we in one of the articles, we talk about um, the three, pillar, three pillars that, that we've used to assess the quality of historical observations, and you can see it broken out by the different variables. Um, another way that you can use the Data User's Guide is to evaluate uh, climate models and select model outputs for company-specific analyses. Um, navigate different frameworks for selecting potential future climate conditions. So this is the sort of question about climate scenario se selection that we get a lot. Um, so if you're looking at things like climate scenarios or even the, the newer um, approaches to using uh, global warming levels. So there's an article based on that. Um, and then there's also a couple articles that look at advantages and disadvantages of existing historical and future climate data sources. So there's a lot of information in there, um, and I recommend that you check it out and um, uh, go through the articles and um, take a look at, at the information that's in there. Um, the other thing I wanted to draw attention to were some other deliverables that are either in the final production stages or have recently come out. Um, so one is our wildfire tool evaluation report and online inventory. So the climate data inventory, when it was first published, didn't include um, uh, wildfire data sets, and that was because we sort of specifically called uh, took out those data sets because we wanted to do an additional analysis on them, um, just given the complexity of, of wildfire as a hazard to model um, and project. So I'm really pleased to say that there's a, a report that we just released, and we are in the final stages of testing for an online interactive tool that is very similar to the, cl the climate data inventory. Um, it's just for different wildfire products. Um, like I said, we have our climate data gap analysis. It's currently out for external review, and we see this as a snapshot reference that takes stock of existing climate data gaps relevant to power system planning and operations. Um, we do hope that this is a resource that evolves over time, gives a sense of, of where um, research might be um, most efficient in terms of developing new data that could be relevant to the power sector. Um, so it would be great if we could, you know, update this in the future and say we actually feel like these gaps have been addressed um, in a particular way. And then we have our compound hazards white paper um, that's also in final publication and should be coming out a little bit later this summer. We recognize that this is um, a, a um, a type of threat that is that is very impactful and very much of interest. Um, so we're excited by that thought leadership piece as well. Um, in terms of building climate literacy, we have our suite of Climate 101 trainings. Um, more than 800 people have taken Climate 101, either in person or virtually. So we're really proud of the extent um, that we've been able, to, or the extent of the audience that we've been able to reach through Climate 101. Um, the first training that we did was Physical Climate Data 101, which consists of three modules. It's an introduction to physical climate data um, and talks about different um, aspects of climate data that, um, that would be useful for uh, power system analysis. The second one is Climate Hazard Exposure and Vulnerability Assessment 101, also three modules. The third one, we are uh, under development right now. It's going to be focused on um, more topics related to uh, potentially resilience planning, although we haven't finalized the scope there yet. The link here will take you to the Climate Ready uh, Climate 101 training site where you can see the different modules, um, and we have a few quick insight documents that we've put together um, that distill some of the key concepts 
from the trainings. If you're interested in requesting a training or hosting a training, you can also um, use that link there and we'd be happy to talk more specifically about that. Um, in terms of some other Workstream One inter external engagement activities, we know that there's a lot of expertise in climate data outside of EPRI and outside of the industry, and we, we've been work working really hard to make connections with organizations. So um, we've established several collaborative relationships with national labs and universities to jointly advance industry-relevant research, and that's been a great area of partnership for us, um, a wonderful opportunity to um, see what's going on in, in those organizations and to be able to, to bring that research and bring those insights into the ready framework. Um, two Workstream staff, myself and my colleague Delavay Diaz, served as authors on multiple chapters of the recently published fifth National Climate Assessment. Um, so great to be able to bring the ready perspective there, um, but also um, advance scientific consensus on topics that are relevant to um, climate ready. And then um, finally, Workstream One weather and climate data analysis has been featured in discussion forums and joint workshops um, related to the recent FERC Order 896. Um, so trying to make sure that the work that we do in Workstream One is, is relevant for a regulatory context as well. And my final slides um, before I pass it on to Workstream 2 is uh, just thinking about what's ahead for Workstream 1. Um, so we have a few more deliverables that we are planning and uh, wanting to complete before Climate Ready wraps up next year. So we'll be working on those. Um, we're also uh, looking to identify collaborative opportunities to fill some of the climate data gaps that we identified. Um, so that's something that, that we're thinking about what could be some near-term near opportunities for data development. And then we are also supporting the other work streams with their climate data needs. Um, so Workstream 1 has been working very closely with Workstreams 2 and 3 to understand what climate data they need to do their analysis and be, um, build their elements of the framework. This has been most apparent in um, the case studies that the other work streams have been working on. And so we're planning to continue to support them um, in their climate data efforts there. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Jeff Thomas. Um, if anyone has any questions, in, in terms of what we've been working on in Workstream 1, please feel free to drop them in the chat and I am more than happy to answer them there. So thanks so much everyone. Appreciate your support of Workstream 1 and looking forward to uh, continuing to work together for the last year of Climate Ready. All right, thanks Laura and thanks for setting the bar high with that, that, that last um, visual of an actual runway for landing the plane. So we're gonna Come up a little short on that from Workstream 2. We don't have those kind of great visuals, um, but maybe I'll adopt that in the future. So just want to, um, yeah, introduce myself. I'm Jeff Thomas. I'm um, one of the coordinators for Workstream 2. So along with um, Doug Dorr, another coordinator, and our lead, Brandon Dellis, just want to walk through what we've um, seen the last 12 months and what we've done. Just starting off with some quick highlights. Um, one of the first things we started into on the Workstream 2 side of things was a literature review series of all the different asset vulnerabilities. Um, so over the last 12 months, we've published all of these. So one volume each, one for um, nuclear assets, one for non-nuclear thermal and the renewables, um, one that hits the cross-cutting topics of health and safety, environmental justice, and ecological patterns. One on uh, transmission distribution, and then the most recent one was the end use assets and distributed energy resources, which just published out last month. So if you haven't seen that one, that one is um, fresh off the presses. Um, and so I think we really stepped back on that one and took some time to identify the end use assets that were most of value to you all. Um, so hopefully we hit the mark there. One of the other publications from um, this, this calendar year back in April, we published our asset vulnerability assessment guidance. So if you haven't seen this document, it's a nice walkthrough, kind of getting us all speaking the same language on what a vulnerability assessment is for assets. We stopped um, there. We didn't go into the system vulnerability assessment, but we, um, we did provide some good examples of, of vulnerability assessments in this document. Um, and we walked through what we're proposing as the climate ready framework for an asset vulnerability assessment um, going through scoping, how you consider the different hazards um, and exposure to the, from those hazards to the asset. Um, and then uh, most importantly, you know, how you characterize the different vulnerabilities and um, how you prepare and summarize results leading into the next step. So if you're just ending at a vulnerability assessment, that's one thing. But if you're leading into more of a, a system adaptation and response plan, then um, you might want to uh, summarize your results in a different way. 
And one of the things we did in this document also is we introduced our asset climate vulnerabilities um, database or matrices. Um, and we included an example of that framework in the appendix. So um, we did indicate in there that we would have um, as supplemental information upon request um, access, you know, to these to these matrices. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about the game plan there in a second. Um, the, over the last year, we really have spent a lot of time building out those matrices, and so they currently exist as an access database, um, summarizing all of them. And not only have we spent a lot of time identifying the various impacts, so we think we have a pretty good handle at this point on the different impacts to the different asset types from a wide variety of different climate variables um, with a lot of information related to that, but we're also spending a lot of time um, building out some specific details that can help inform your system modeling and planning our WorkStream 3 efforts um, as, we, as we populate this with more specific examples and, and numbers and quantify it as much as we can. Um, things like, you know, if we're saying air temperature is an issue, what is that air temperature threshold that starts to become a problem? Um, what is the level of consequence? Can we quantify that con consequence? Um, you know, lots of different things. You can see all the different um, specific questions that we're asking ourselves and our subject matter experts throughout this process. We get a lot of, um, well, you can't get a number because it depends. So then we kind of nail them down a little bit and say, so what does it depend on? Um, and we're calling these our vulnerability modifiers. We're trying to capture these in the database as well. Um, and lastly, we've spent a lot of time over the last 12 months building out the adaptation strategy. So trying to get a complete menu of you know, if this is the impact, what have you done? What can be done? How much does that cost? We're trying to trying to estimate relative cost per unit um, and then also relative benefit. And so there's a lot of work that's gone into this. Um, we are continuing to populate it. We understand that, you know, we're not gonna have all the answers in this database, but it is gonna be a really good framework for you to start with. So if a company wants to go through their vulnerability assessment, they can use this database as a good starting point It'll have the fields, the questions in there that you'll want to ask yourselves and your subject matter experts. And hopefully in most places, we're going to have some kind of number to start with. So a placeholder that um, isn't wrong for your system modeling purposes that you can start with and, and hopefully refine based on your site specific conditions. So the way we've gotten to the point where we are now is over the last um, six to eight months or so, uh, starting in kind of late summer of 2023, we, we convened um, a series of eight different asset working groups. So you can see the breakdown there on the far right. Um, and what we did is we really worked with these working groups that were made up of subject matter experts from your utilities, um, codes and standards organizations were involved, original equipment manufacturers, um, all these different groups, national labs, and we had monthly or even every two week calls for some of these groups um, from the late summer of 2023 all the way through the spring of 2024. Right now, some are even still continuing into this summer. And so we use this um, consortium of, of, of experts to really confirm the list of ex impacts, say, hey, we've hit all the impacts. Um, we've gotten good examples of some of the quantifications that we want where we can, and then also building out the adaptation strategies. So um, it's really good to hear pers personal firsthand experience to say, hey, you know, this station flooded and we did this. You know, it was a really cool opportunity to hear that firsthand, get those anecdotal stories and incorporate those into the database. Um, quick shout out to everybody that was involved in that. Thank you all. It's been um, a, a really good learning experience, I think, for everybody involved that was part of those calls. Okay, so next steps, like I mentioned, the vulnerabilities database, you know, that's a big effort of what we're trying to do. I think it's going to be a pretty valuable resource, um, currently exists as an access database. We are in the process of finalizing that to get it out to you all any, any minute now for a month long build out period. So we're going to share it to you all as a, a series of Excel workbooks by asset class um, and then get your feedback. So not just on, you know, the framework and how it looks, but also help us populate it. So where there are gaps provide your site specific um, examples and we can we can build those into it. Um, and then ultimately the goal is to build it out as an online tool um, alongside the climate data inventory. So that is already a great tool as, as Laura mentioned. If you haven't seen that, you can take a look at that um, and we hope to build this out right alongside of it and integrate it into it as well. 
So throughout the process, um, you know, the term, the idea of fragility curves comes up quite a bit as a great way to represent the vulnerability of an asset to a climate hazard. Um, not just vulnerabilities, but, you know, performance curves, all these other, other types of relationships seem to be pretty rel relevant. So we're doing a lot of work in this area. Um, we are hoping to publish very soon in, in the next, you know, over the next few months, um, a guidance document for how you might develop fragility curves and what, what your considerations are there. We're also um, looking to undergo a, um, a developing a repository or a clearinghouse for some of the relevant fragility curves that already exist. That might help us identify some gaps. And then finally, we've initiated a case study where we're looking at the relationship of high air temperatures on three different um, asset types, inverters, batteries, and transformers. And so that one should be pretty interesting as we walk through this process of how you might develop a fragility curve and what other meaningful information you might be able to get out of the data sets that are available. Other ongoing case studies, um, these should be wrapping up. Uh, a couple of these are wrapping up soon. Um, the vulnerability assessment and nuclear power plant the work is done. We're working on putting that into a story map, so you should see that soon. Um, same with the bottom one there, the uh, um, effect of, of um, future wind projections on integration of, of wind turbines in a rural network. Um, that work is done as, as well as part of a DOE grant, so we're working on building that out as a story map. Um, the middle one there on, on the hydropower vulnerabilities, that one is ongoing. We're making great progress. We're already getting good results, but the final deliverable, you probably won't see that one until uh, closer to um, uh, early to mid-2025. Some other relevant actor activities here, um, uh, in addition to the Fragility Curves database, we're also looking to build out an inventory of weather-related standards. Um, we, we know these are important. These can be great numbers to start with for modeling purposes. Um, so we're building that out, and it also should identify some gaps on standards that need to be, need to be updated. Um, we're very close to um, publishing. We have a, a good draft, and Anna should say, of um, looking at future projections of tree interactions with power lines. So some of the considerations that go into how you might project your future risks associated with um, tree falls on power lines. So that's a nice um, high level summary document that should point to areas that um, would allow for a deeper dive. And the last one here is starting to look at how we can consider nature-based solutions for climate change adaptations to redu reduce some of the, uh, the risk that you all might see, might see at some of your different asset types. That is all I wanted to share. I appreciate everybody's attention today and happy to address any questions in the chat. Um, I do have a couple summary slides or extra slides here for when you guys get these slides, get this slide deck. So a little bit more detail for you to um, take a look at at your leisure. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat and turn it over to Aknoff. Aknoff? Hey, thanks, Jeff. Um, that was a, a, a great overview of Workstream 2 and, and, and Laura as well from, from Workstream 1. Um, my name is Aknoff Mittal. I'm one of the three um, Workstream leads in Workstream 3. Um, we've had a very big uh, year in terms of where Workstream 3 is, is going, trying to synthesize all that information from, um, from Workstream 1 and Workstream 2 into the power system analysis process. So year two, our focus was um, the Texas case study. So um, to, to understand how to, to get that climate data information, that asset vulnerability information into a decision making framework. Um, our approach in Workstream 3 was to implement it with a top to bottom framework that addresses climate adaptation across the entire spectrum of the power system planning process. So we, we have a very, very complex um, framework, which you can see in the flow chart on the top right. And what we've 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 tried to 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 do with the Texas case study is um, implement and refine a methodology through an application of the framework to a realistic power system model. So we've been working with a synthetic model for for Texas. Um, we're, we're we're able to share results publicly. Um, over the course of year two, we, we, we worked with many different subject matter experts within EPRI, cutting across Workstream 1, Workstream 2, as well as all the, the, the modeling and planning experts that we have on the Workstream 3 side um, to, to, to develop the assessments and, and methods that we're going to need to make decisions in how we invest in our system. 
All of this culminated with a workshop that um, many of your team and many of the attendees here attended um, on May 8th and 9th in Washington, DC, um, where we walked through different applications of the WorkStream 3 framework um, to, 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 to support decision-making in the power system um, process. As I mentioned, it's a top to bottom framework, so it, it, it integrates all of that climate data and asset vulnerability information at different stages and, and, and passes it down to different modeling processes and assessment methods to be able to, 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 to basically quantify and characterize impacts that climate are, it, it, climate events are going to have on the power system and how we might, might want to evaluate different adaptations um, to the system. It's, it's a really, really complex effort. And we understand that not all companies have the structure in place that allows for a fully integrated planning process. There's you know, different assets that you own, there's different planning responsibilities that you, that, you, that you have. So what we really wanted to show in DC is how you can identify the common touch points and structures of data that allow you to pass information in the parts of the framework that are relevant to you to make a more informed climate decision. Where does that really start? So at the top of this framework, what we, we, we came to this understanding that we need to know where to start directing our tools to understand the impacts of extreme events. Climate data is a really, really large space. So being able to identify extremes which exist as very rare events within that very large space is a a, a a challenge right so we need to create enough information to have a sufficient set of extreme events that we can test our planning decisions against so working with workstream one we were able to create a a, a process that gave us a very very large um state space of of of, of climate data information um, we pass that through the asset vulnerabilities um, that, that, that WorkStream 2 um, developed. So understanding when um, a generator might be derated, when a generator might be unavailable, when there might be transmission constraints um, on, 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 on the system um, was, was really, really important to understand when we might want to, to address extreme event challenges on your system. Um, the culminating piece of, of, of that screening process is a tool called the risk screening tool. So um, convenient acronym uh, where the, the, the risk tool is, is, is basically able to process and parse large amounts of climate and weather data um, to identify time periods and events where we might have potential high risk of energy shortfall. So we, we, we take that weather signal, the asset vulnerabilities on the, the, the generation side and the weather and climate impacts on the load and, and, and basically convolute them to understand when we are going to have periods of high um, energy risk in, in, in our system. And what this, this, this approximate method does is it points us in the right direction. It tells us when we should be studying um, a, a resource adequacy assessment um, in, 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 in terms of challenges to the system that you might not see from a reliability perspective. So it's, it's feeding into that concept of climate resilience. Um, we're working to make this tool publicly available. We have had conversations with many of you already um, to, uh, to, to begin the discussions of how to integrate it into your processes. Um, it'll be available as a, 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 a as the source code is published on a um, Git repository, and we'll 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 we'll, we'll continue those conversations and, and 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 work to evolve the tool over year three um, as we move forward. But this tool basically tells us where to look for for those climate event extremes and 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 use it to to, to begin planning our models. Where does that feed in? So what we, 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 we walk through are different questions that may be answered. And if you'll see that those three flow charts that I have in, in, in these different ad, um, applications are leveraging different pieces of the, the, the climate ready WorkStream 3 framework. Um, the common theme through all of them is that we're using the risk screening tool and, and using a common starting point for what our generation technologies and our end use technologies are, are, are going to be on the system. And then we apply 
different pieces of the framework selectively to answer different questions. And in, in, in the first, where we're looking at an integrated operational planning um, uh, problem across the bulk and distribution system, where we're, we're trying to understand how you can balance planned resilience against operational resilience. The, the, the primary challenge here being that you're not going to ever be able to plan for all of the extreme events that, that you might face as a system operator. So if you, 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 you shoot for a targeted level of resilience in your system, what are some of the operational flexibility decisions that you can make to, to, to mitigate the impacts from extreme events across your system? In the second ad, um, application, we were looking at how are the sensitivities around um, uh, asset adaptation for a single class going to look like, right? So if you're you're making a decision to um, adapt a generating facility um, to be more resilient to extreme temperature conditions, how does the evolving system around you impact that 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 decision in terms of the value that it, it, it provides to you as that that asset owner so if if there's many units that are all making that same decision um when does it begin to translate into a a, a societal benefit that 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 needs a a market design shift to be able to ensure that you get return on value for for the decisions that you're making and then the last question that, that we looked at at the bulk system level is 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 understanding how transmission planning is is evolving from a a, a question of deliverability to a question of balancing generation availability and evolving into transmission adequacy. So how do we begin to plan for extreme events during that, that transmission planning process? Um, this aligns with very, very nicely with the um, FERC order 896 that, that is currently resulting in the TPL-8 standard. So the, the, this process is, is, is really in line with the decisions that you're gonna have to make um, from, from that perspective. So that, 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 that understanding of when to start planning and, 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 and studying using the climate data information on these power system, bulk system planning processes is, is really driven by the outputs of risk. At the distribution level, we, we've, we've taken a more localized approach that is looking at these acute clim climate hazards, right? A lot of the capacity planning decisions can account for more of the chronic impacts that climate change is going to drive on your system. Um, what we're trying to do now is uh, drive toward um, a, 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 a localized look at where climate is going to, to, to create consequences and impacts on your system. So it, it, it feeds into those local load projections. And we, we, what we really want to ultimately aim at is coordinating resilience with capacity needs on your system. Um, in terms of the year two deliverables, we, 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 these are all links if you click on the pictures when the, 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 the slides are um, uh, delivered to you. But we, we really focus on getting the, the, the material out publicly in the um, DC workshop. So we have three um, presentation decks that, that have deep dives into all of the applications that, that, that I discussed. Um, we produced two ready quick insight documents that, that looked at how you might approach planning for extreme events across different timescales. Um, and then approaches to, 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 to future hourly um, climate resilience for, for, for um, power system planning. What's next for um, Workstream 3? There's a very big year three uh, planned ahead. Um, in, in, in the first box, we're gonna publish all of, or we're gonna publish the Texas case study as a story map along with two um, member case studies, one focused on the Midwest, one focused on a regional coordinated area. Um, the Workstream 3 guidance um, is, is going to capture all of the information that went into the development of those case studies and publish it as an online re repository that provides guidance and best practice to account for climate and extreme impacts on, in the planning process, along with a whole list of other deliverables that are focused on multiple different areas of the, the, the planning process, um, ranging from hurricane impacts, um, to gas electric sector dependencies um, and, and a, a whole variety of, of, of different information that, that is all aligned with the processes and methods that we've developed in, in, in Workstream 3. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it back to Morgan. And if you have any questions, more than happy to answer them in the chat. Morgan. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Eknas, and also to Laura and Jeff. I think it's really great to be able to take this pause and stock of what's been going on. There is, as you can see, a lot of activity in each of our three work streams, and that is not only not going to slow down, but accelerate through year three. So in these last 10 minutes, I want you to hear from you. Um, so I thought we'd take a moment to pause and hear from two of our participants in Climate Ready. So Anna Brockaway is one of our member company representatives and Michael Craig is one of the advisors through the CRAG. Um, and so wanted to invite them to the stage. So Anna and Michael, please feel free to turn on your, your videos and um, come on up, so to speak. Um, and want to hear a little bit of perspective from each of you. Um, so if I can start actually with Anna. Anna, let me make sure you can um, join into this conversation and come off of mute. So let me do a quick sound check with you. Hi, Morgan. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Perfect. Yeah, great. Wonderful. So as we heard from Steve at the beginning of this conversation, SCE is well underway in this space, right? You, you've done an assessment, you've filed with your regulator, and I think one of the things that we really get in Climate Ready from the participating members is kind of the ground truthing, right, around how does this actually work. So I wonder if you could just share with us a, a perspective on some of your lessons learned from what you've done um, that can inform us in Climate Ready and those that are on the line in terms of the company experience in taking on this question. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for the opportunity. And thank you, everybody, for, for paying attention and being involved in this initiative. It's hugely important. Um, so Southern California Edison completed our first vulnerability assessment in 2022. Um, and we looked at temperature, precipitation, sea level rise, wildfire, and cascading events over multiple time horizons in that assessment. And the risks that we had identified in that assessment essentially served as the foundation of some climate-driven adaptations that we proposed in our general rate case the following year. But the adaptations were proposed were really kind of developed as augmentations to existing programs. So whereas where we would have done some number of transformer replacements before, we increased that number and we, we proposed some additional number of transformer replacements. Um, but as we kind of head into our next vulnerability assessment filing, um, we're really seeing a need to dramatically change how we build out the grid in our system. Um, we are projecting over 80% demand growth in our territory between 2022 and 2045, and our internal modeling suggests that we need to increase the rate that, at which we build transmission four times and distribution 10 times in order to meet this demand. Um, and so uh, the kind of doing climate driven investments as augmentations to existing programs, we can't really account for forward looking climate exposure at the same time as we plan for significant demand growth. And so we really see the need very clearly to actually embed climate into our planning processes themselves um, to ensure that those processes are appropriately considering future conditions. And that's very obviously very aligned with ready deliverables, particularly in work streams two and three, where we're really taking a look at what are those asset impacts and really putting them then into the, the processes with which we build our grid. Yeah, love that. Thank you so much. And I think, you know, this point you make about how much your low growth is, is changing is a really important one in this conversation, right? Because just as we see electrification to meet decarbonization goals and, and more and more reliance on the grid, this question of resilience becomes more and more important. So really appreciate that perspective. Michael, we have benefited from your perspective quite a bit through Climate Ready as well. So really grateful for the time you spent with us. You've presented at some of our workshops um, and you've got some incredible work in the space. And I, I'd love to hear from you kind of what is that vision for you as what I'll call an industry stakeholder in your role for what a climate resilient future looks like? And then how do you think about the ways that this climate ready framework that we're looking to publish next year are going to be supportive of you, your efforts and, and the grid at large? Happy to and thanks so much for the opportunity and to all the members and participants, the workshops have been great in part I've been able to share, but then also to learn from everybody else. So I. Uh, the first thing that we need to change is just how we think about making decisions about investments. And that means new frameworks for making decisions that allow us to account for more uncertainty and weather and its impacts. And I think the climate ready framework has a lot of great tools already for that. And as you go through this presentation, right, it's amazing all the different areas that you're working in, but the guidance on fragility curves, the guidance on incorporating weather and especially future climate data with all of its nuances, I think is really invaluable for us just making 
for improving our decision making frameworks. But I think once we have those better frameworks in place, which is important for a climate resilient future, I think we'll also see that there's a lot of new investments that we need to make at all scales. We can think of at the transmission scale, we can think of uh, hardening existing assets that we have, but probably also maybe investing in just new assets that we don't already have in generation and transmission to increase redundancy, to get a more diverse portfolio of climate risk in our system. We can think about even interconnecting regions so that we can balance load across larger areas to get away from more localized extremes, maybe. And then we can even think at smaller scales, thinking about vulnerable community communities or places that um, have not been upgraded in our distribution network for a while. What sorts of upgrades do we need there to equip them to be resilient against extreme weather events? And so I think there's a lot of investments that's going to happen that will be guided by those updated decision making frameworks. And I think things that we often don't think as much about maybe, but things like technology standards, what standard are we planning for when we are designing or installing our transformers or our stationary storage? How are we engaging with customers to get more grid flexibility? Improving all of those things will also be core components of a climate resilient future. And again, I mean, you go through the, the climate ready framework that you have together, there are so many great tools available that uh, we in our research lab are using and will continue to use, and I'm sure many others are as well, things like the risk screening matrices, the case studies that you're going, the integration of these different components of what we power system planners work with in our modeling uh, that I think are really invaluable for helping us understand the value of different investments and what our options actually are. Uh, Michael, thanks. There's so much you just said there, which was great. And I, I'll pull one thread, which is you noted, you noted regionality, right? And, and how we can think about this question at a regional level. We talk about that a lot, right? In terms of climate impacts can be at times hyper-local. They certainly impact from a regional standpoint and are different from a regional standpoint. And in many respects, you can only be as resilient as your neighbor. So what does that actually mean when we think about assessing one's risk um, and approach? So really appreciate you um, sharing that and everything that you just shared with us and, and thanks for your participation. So with that, just a quick wrap up in terms of where we are and where we're going. Uh, so I, I showed this slide earlier Earlier, but I just want to touch on quickly that, um, as Michael said, there are a lot of deliverables out there that are already being used. We're very focused on no one is waiting for the final framework and that to the extent we can be putting technical resources out there now to provide information to inform this work, we want to be doing that. So. 20 deliverables almost last year um, and lots of opportunities to engage 130 workshops, webcasts, and external events, frankly, almost sounds like too much when you sum that number, but it includes a number of asset working group calls. Um, so not everyone is on the same webcast, but a lot of opportunity to plug in and to engage. So as we look ahead, just a couple of notes. One is join us in the Northeast. Uh, in August, we head to Brooklyn for our fourth and final uh, uh, I just talked about regional uh, impacts. This is our regional workshop series with the national labs. This one will be co-hosted with Brookhaven and we are going to dig into the topics of flooding and clouds. Um, so really excited to dig into those topics um, and really a wonderful experience. Thanks to Aguarin for dropping the registration link in there. It is an open meeting. So we really encourage you to come join us the topics are relevant, particularly in the Northeast, but I'm certain those of you on the line uh, have experience with flooding and need to know more about clouds as well. So really would love to see you there. We have many engagements already planned through year three and welcome you to suggest engagements moving forward and a ton of deliverables headed your way as we look to, as we say, land the plane um, and the culminating deliverable will be the framework uh, and we'll tell you more about what that means and looks like in future webcasts uh, coming your way in spring of 2025. So we know we need to be better accounting for climate into our long range planning of the power system of the future. You all with your experience, expertise, your organizations bring an important vantage point into that development of our work. Um, so I really encourage you as we move into year three, if you're engaged, lean in and keep engaging. We need your input. And if you're not, join us. So email us at climateready at epri.com. We'd love to bring you into the fold. With that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us for our State of Ready. Uh, and we look forward to working with you in the year to come. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.